All right, um, sorry about the delay. We're just dealing with some uh, technical difficulties. So um, my name is Han. I'm uh, one of the scientific computing consultants. So today is a, uh, I'm gonna give you the uh, introduction to job submission uh, tutorial. And standing right next to me, I'm not sure if you can see in the Zoom, is Angel. He's also will be helping out, answer questions. And can Zoom people actually hear, hear me talking? Yep, you're good. Yeah. Can can you guys hear me on the Zoom land? Yes. Yeah. Great. All right. So so let's get started. So today we're going to talk about how do we submit jobs uh, at MSI, and um, and let just so here is the uh, overview. Um, so I'll be talking first of all. I'll be make sure that um, I want to make sure that um, the recommended background for this tutorial is actually some basic Unix commands and some bash scripting experience. And the training level is actually at the beginner's level. And uh, I'll be presenting slides and also along with hands-on examples of how to submit jobs. Okay, so so first off, I want to say that we I will try to show you how to connect to MSI. And then I'll go into a little bit of uh, our MSI HPC hardware. And then I'm going to like job scheduling and then how do we actually submit jobs? And then after that, once we submit our jobs, we usually would like to monitor the jobs, how, how does it work? And I'll, I'll show you some uh, pointer on those. And also I'll go into troubleshooting tips, how if something goes wrong and what can you do about it? And so throughout the tutorial, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll give you some hands-on demo. I'll use a terminal uh, window to show you uh, uh, commands and how to run the command. Like that. So, um, if you are on, if you are, um, if you are, if you have a terminal uh, screen ready, you can fire it up and then just uh, follow along. If not, you can also just look at the slide, uh, just see how we do it. Okay. So this is the intro. Um, okay. So the first thing is that why do we need a need to use more computers, right? Uh, most of the time, we're just using our laptop or a workstation in our lab. But sometimes the problem is getting the problem that we're trying to solve or the computation that we're trying to carry out. It actually demands a lot more computing power. So, for example, I, I gave some examples here. Like the statistics students want to cross validate their model, and this involves running model a thousand times. So, by each run, would take an hour. So, running on their laptop, this would not be. You will not see the result until well, for a very, very long time. So you might want to like uh, high throughput computing in that case. And also, if there's a genomic researcher that she's been using some small data set or playing with some small data sets, like, like a sequencing data, but when the new data set comes in, which is say 10 times or 100 times larger than what she's used to, and I'm sure she would also need some higher performance computing power to analyze the data sets. So, Another one very common is that a, an engineer is, is uh, do, using some uh, packages that would allow to run the simulation in parallel. But in order to take advantage of the parallelization of the package that it offered, so he might not be able to run on his desktop. So in that case, he will most likely uh, come to MSI and use MSI XPC cluster to run his simulation in parallel. So in all these cases, more computer means more computing power. and it also means that you cut down your computational time. So it also means that you can actually uh, manipulate or handle large data sets and solving large problems. Okay. And by the way, if there's any question, you can just feel free to ask me to, so that I know. Okay. So here I, I put up some examples that what people have been doing using MSI HPC computing power. Uh, so they, like I said, you want to solve large problems with a little time. You want to run a simulation or do analysis of large volume of data that would not be possible on your standard computer workstation. So here are the uh, very um, interesting, actually very good example that we can look into, or you guys can look into how they actually use up, taking take advantage of the HPC power that we have to get their, uh, to work on their research. And I put down a link here at the bottom. So you can go, if you're interested, you guys can go in there and take a look. And that we have so many, many examples. For example, someone was looking into the panda genomics uh, problems. And also there are some deep learning, uh, uh, deep learning research being carried out using HPC computer. So there are just many of them. Okay. Um, okay, so first thing, 
So how do we actually connect to MSI in order to use the HPC clusters? All right, so first of all, um, if you're already on the URM network, you could just fire up a terminal, but let's say you're outside the URM network. So the first thing to do is using a, uh, through a VPN. So I put down this uh, little screenshot here that I'm, I'm on the Mac. <clears throat> So on the Mac, you need a client. We, I have the uh, any client, any connect Cisco client. I will use this. I will go into UMN split tunnel, and then I click connect, and I type in my username, which is uh, my dot x five new username, and then the password, and then I just click connect, and then you should file. You should activate my VN, uh, VPN connection. So after that, after that. After the VPN connection, we can just uh, fire up a terminal. So what I mean is that we're actually using a uh, SSH connection, which is a command line uh, command that you, you use uh, from a terminal. Another way, besides terminal, um, another way is to use a web browser. Okay, a, a web browser um, is another way to, but uh, for, for uh, I just want to say, uh, for submitting a job, we, we should use a, um, use a terminal because it would be something job from a, from the command line. So personally, I prefer using a SSH connection from a terminal window. So below are two, uh, two links that you guys can look into how to actually connect to HPC interactively. Okay, so the, so the standard method of interacting with HPC systems is using a command line interface. And so we have a very good tutorial, which is the uh, introduction to Linux tutorial. It will actually go through uh, some basic Linux command to get you uh, comfortable navigating around the Linux terminal. Um, feel free to check it out. Okay. So, okay. So I was talking about SSH. So on a Linux or on a Mac, user can SSH directly to Masabi, Mongi, or Agate. Agate is our newest cluster using terminal application. So the command that our user use is that the command that I usually use is SSH dash capital Y, and then using my username and then adds, for example, masabi.u uh, msi.um and edu. And it depends on your um which cluster you prefer. But uh, right now the, the best cluster is the agate cluster, and I would I would use the agate and then and then maybe the masabi or mangi. But it also depends on uh how how you what type of application you're trying to run. But the most high performance cluster we have is the agate. So when you log in, you're actually directly using uh, a login node. So after you log in, the login node can be viewed as a, can be seen as an interface to the compute node. So here are the login nodes. So not, uh, so uh, first thing first is that login nodes are, are not for computational workload because there are a login node for uh, many, usually there are many, users on a login node and you do not want to perform any computational computation workload on a login node. And right, I, I put down here that three clusters and each login node will have a designated uh, node ID or host name. So for Mongi, you, you, you will see LN1001 or LN1002. Uh, and for Masabi, you will see LN00 and then an integer number that follows it. And then for Agate, and you would see AHL zero, and then some integer following it. You see one, two, and three, and four. That means we have four login nodes for Agit. Okay, um, let's see. So here, okay, here uh, the screenshot. So when you do a login, and uh, actually I could also show you using a uh, terminal. Yeah. So can everybody see the terminal screen okay? All right, so, okay. So you wanna log in. So assuming I'm on the U of M network, I'll use SSH dash Y. And this is my username. And then I would go say, I wanna to go to Masabi. All right. And then it would ask, yes. I wanna continue to connect. And now I'm on. 
and I need to type my password. Okay, and I, and you go through this step, which is uh, dual authentication. And then I have my token here. So I can pick one. I'll need to push it to my uh, cell phone. This should be okay. All right. So, so once I'm authenticated, then I'm on a so I just log on to a Masabi uh, hand, uh, login note. You can see that it is LN006. So what you will also see it is the uh, the message that once you log in. So does anybody have any questions about this? So you have to go through a dual and type in your password and get authenticated and then log in. All right. Okay, and this go for the monkey and agate. All right. So okay, for window users, um, you got we have to use uh, Putty or, or, or some variants of it, and you have to. So I'm here put down some snapshot uh, window screen capture. So you use Mangi here. I'm using the Mangi, and you write down port twenty two, and you also like to enable X eleven forwarding. And then if you if you did all that, then you should be able to get a terminal, and then you can just type in your password. So here is a link to show. It's a every Q page that we set up to help you. Uh, configure party to connect to our system, okay? So here is a graphical uh, browser. So usually, um, personally, I, I'm not too, um, uh, I guess I don't use it very often uh, because I'm a terminal, I'm, I'm a terminal guy. So here you can type nx.msi.um.edu. And then once you get authenticated and log in, you can bring up a, uh, a terminal window like a shell so and that would bring in that will help you to uh, get onto HPC. So here's a link for the uh, also have, have a FAQ page to get started with the annex. So annex and also because you also use a notebook.msi.um.edu. So you find a browser type in this URL and you should once you log in, you can bring up a terminal. And here is a little terminal that I, I you could bring up uh, using notebook using using this uh, URL. I guess you, from this web page, uh, you can use the terminal. So you, you can start working directly from there. Okay, and here bottom is a is a link, uh, show you how to use a, a web browser uh, using notebook to get a terminal or to connect to MSI. So we call that a graphical uh, graphical connection using web browser, but we really prefer uh, using a terminal because everything would be command line oriented. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Okay. So I'm going to go into like overview of job scheduling. So what is, what is job scheduling? Um, it is a process of arranging, controlling, and <clears throat> optimizing work and workloads in a shared HPC environment. What that means is that our HPC environment, the HPC clusters uh, limit, is a limit of resources and everybody has to share among everybody. All right, so why do we need job scheduling? Well, because MSI should, uh, serves over 900 groups of uh, 900 groups and over 4,500 users with limited HPC resources. Um, and, and, and also we want, we want to automate allocation of limited resources to everybody. So everybody get a chance to use the HPC clusters. And then we also want to track and monitor everybody's job running on HPC, okay? And also, what do we use to uh, to do to do all that? So MSI uses the uh, Slurm, which is a um, stands for a Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management. It is a very complicated software package. And but there's some quick highlight here. I put down some quick highlights for uh, uh, for Slurm. It, essentially, it comes down it comes down to just it decides who gets what and when. Okay, so it schedules jobs to be executed on a cluster machine based on priorities. So each job when you submit it has a priority value associated with it. And also pending jobs are actually queued jobs waiting to be executed. And jobs are submitted by user uh, using the shell commands. And Slurm has, is, is good about how to take care of the input and output of your job. And then Slurm also launches jobs on Dustin aside the compute nodes and clean up after each job finishes. finishes. Okay, so these, these are just some quick highlights of the Slurm, uh, Slurm package. 
um, job scheduler. Okay, so some basic concept and terminology. So high performance computers, it stands for like HPC. So high, it is a high speed network connecting multiple HPC nodes into a cluster that enables parallel computation and data processing capabilities. We have HPC actually have high performance storage, uh, GPUs and lots of CPUs not to mention and large amount of memory in order to support some of the most compute and memory intensive programs developed today. And there's also a term called uh, we used, uh, which is the partition. So for partitions, you can see as a set of uh, hardware, we group together with different resource and policy limitation, and each has a different characteristics. Okay, to to fit different to fit different jobs. So so what is the jobs? So here the the jobs um, is actually is computation workloads that run on HPC computers. Uh, the the key terms here that is going to be associated that are going to be associated with jobs are compute resources like the node, the CPU, the memory, and then maybe the, st the storage uh, space. And also one of the key things about running a job is that we have to know how long the job would take to run or to finish. So there's a wartime term here, wartime limit. And also like I mentioned earlier, there's the priority term. So each job is associated with priority value and Slurm will calculate each job priority and then based on the priority and depends on which job to run uh, uh, which job to be launched and which job would be wait would be waiting in the queue. Okay. So here, um, so for the HPC cluster that we have, we have Masabi, Mamgi, and Agate. For, Mas for Masabi, we have 741 nodes, uh, over 17,000 number of cores. And then we also have 40 nodes with two time, uh, two of those are K40 uh, Tesla GPU uh, uh, chips. And we also have 32 nodes with 480 gigabyte SSD, solid state drives. And for the Mangi, it is a uh, AMD CPU uh, cluster. We have 164 of those, 164 of nodes, and it's and total amount to 20, um, almost 21,000 of course. And some nodes on the Mangi has two uh, TB with terabytes of uh, RAM available. And it also has a, uh, a high performance V100 GPU nodes uh, uh, housed in the Mangi. Uh, so that you could use for GPU computing. And for our latest Agate uh, supercomputer, this one has about 412 nodes. It is also AMD, uh, it is using AMD processors. And some of the nodes have 128 CPU, and some have 24, uh, 64 core per node. So for, uh, it has also have a uh, 344 CPU compute nodes with some of those have 244, uh, 500 gig of memory. And hundred of those have two terabyte of memory. And then we also have 58, 58 GPU compute nodes. 50 of them has a 800, A100 uh, GPU, and eight of them eight, have eight A100 GPU and associated with one TB of memory. So this is actually very high performance computing that we have. And we, this is just recently acquired. And also if you, uh, this one also support the interactive uh, computing, uh, interactive GPU computing, this one has, in Agate, we have 10 GPU interactive nodes, and each of them has a has eight A40 GPUs with 500 k uh, uh, memory age. Okay, so all right, let's go on. So okay, so for high performance computing HPC, this is a very uh, cartoon diagram schematic <clears throat> into what we're actually uh, looking at. That this is uh, this is quite important because when we try to submit job, we actually have to know. The, C, the number of CPU, or actually number of nodes, the CPU uh, that we need. So let's just get, let's just say a network, a HPC is a network of computers from the high performance computing, a uh, form the high performing computing system called a cluster. Each computer in a cluster is called a node. So each node can talk to each other through a high speed network. And each node has multiple processors with multiple cores and large memory. And what is important in this picture is that we actually have has a clock associated with this cluster. Because this is, remember I said the war time limit. So each job has to know, uh, at least we have to know somewhat how long it would take to run. And so we can have a good idea of how much time we're actually requesting to use on the cluster. Okay. So at the bottom, there's a little, uh, little picture here. So we say this is a node in there. So this green, uh, this yellow uh, block here is actually a piece of CPU socket, socket. And here I give 
this uh, physical ID is zero and one. So this will be zero, this will be one. And each of them actually has a core ID from zero to seven. Um, you, we usually have more than that. So the red one is, is, a, is a compute node, and these two are the CPU sockets. So each of them actually housing uh, eight CPU core. Okay. So this is the very simplified high level view of the HPC. Essentially, just a little, <clears throat> essentially, just a little, uh, you can see as a little computer um, with the essential component that we need to run the job. <clears throat> so, okay, now come down to, uh, so now the next thing is to understand the slurring partitions. So, where do I actually find those hardware? So, those hardware are in the slurring partition, uh, in the slurring partitions. So, what is a partition? So, a, a, a partition is a logical set or sets of com compute nodes grouped together depending on their hardware characteristics or function. A slurring, part, a slurring job partition can be seen as an automated waiting list for, you, for use of a particular set of computational hardware. Remember, remember why I said that a uh, uh, job that are queued are waiting to be executed, you'll be sitting in that partition. So different job partitions have different resources and limitations and access con and, and, and control and policy control or policy limitations. And so when you submit a job, you, you want to make sure that your job actually fit in that fit the partition or the hardware in the partition. So make sure to choose a job partition which has resources and limitations suitable to your job. Okay. So here I'm, I list out uh, the partition that we have at the MSI. So, so where do I find the hardware slurring partition exactly? So first of all, we have the uh, federated partitions. So these are the partition with, for example, MSI small, MSI large, MSI big map. So all these partitions are, if you don't care what hardware you're going to get or where your job's going to be run on, you could use this factory partition. Say I have a job needs one CPU and you, you don't have this, you can just say, okay, I submit this, my job to factory partitions. And any, if there is any, if any of those computing resources open up, then your job will run on those, say maybe MSI small. That is when you don't care what hardware you get. So, so job that can run on either Agate or Masabi or Monkey, exactly. So across three clusters, you don't care which one you're gonna get. But if you if you know what uh, partition actually is good for to run your job is needed, then we also have those um, a designated partition like on Agate, and on Agate, uh, all all the partitions are start with AG. We have AG small, AG large, and we also have the uh, AG two TP. So. On Masabi, <clears throat> so on Masabi, we have, uh, we usually we use, uh, you usually see small, large, or, or the uh, AMD small. So with the AMD upfront, that means this, uh, this partition actually is uh, going to the Mangi, you say it belongs to Mangi cluster. Okay, so here are the two links, bottom two links to, to give you more information about the partitions. Okay, um, do you guys have any questions? At this point, about partitions or HPC hardware, anything like that. Okay, if not, I uh, um, so uh, uh, let's see what else I want to tell you more about this. Um, so A one hundred four is 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 a four way GPU. A one hundred GPU eight way is a A one hundred dash eight is eight way A one hundred GPU. Those are very high performing GPU uh, compute nodes that we have. And we're going to go into uh, a little bit more detail about the preempt and interactive partition uh, uh, later on during the tutorial. Okay, so remember to check on those links if you have more, uh, want to take up more information about partitions. Okay, so so now um, I want to talk about what is a job. So what is a job is that it actually is a plain text file that you have to prepare yourself. Uh, for example, in the plain text file, you could Put down the command you want to run, uh, the input where the input data is, and where to, what you do with the output where you want to store the output. So actually, it's a small plain text file, um, or you can say a, a bash script, and that user must submit that job script or the plain text file or call the job script to the Slurm scheduler. The Slurm scheduler would then decide when and where it will run your job. So once the job has finished, the user can get the result back. Of the calculation, get it back, and there is actually no interaction between the user and the program while the job is running. So you submit the job, uh, Slurm scheduler take care of it and put it in the queue, 
And once the compute resource is open up, it, it launches your job, and the job will be run on the compute node. Once it is done, and you can just check on the result of the job. So this is what a job, so this concept of job, this concept of job would just be like that. So here's the life cycle of a slurm job. So first thing is you submit the job, job is added to the partition, and then slurm will calculate the priority of your job. So slurm will assign job priority value to your job. And then once that is done, and you come to, and, you, and the job will sit, in a, sit inside the partition. And job waits until number one, one resources are available and no other job with higher priority in the partition sit, sit in front of a job um, so if there are any higher priority jobs sitting in front of a job those would be uh, run first before your job so usually the wait time is, um, is pretty small but oh, but that depends on uh, what resources what computer resources are you requesting and and how have you been using the cluster um, so and then once that once your job is ready to execute to be run and, and resources are available and Slurm would launch your job. And one thing to uh, pay attention to is that Slurm will kill your job at runtime if your job exceeds the requested amount of resources. For example, it, 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 um, you ask uh, random memory, um, the memory uh, you often see is uh, OOM uh, signal, which is out of memory, the job will be killed. So, um, but this is a general idea of uh, the cycle of a lifetime of a job, okay? So you submit it to a partition that you think would best fit the job, so then give it a priority, and then your job waits in the partition. When the resources is available and no other higher value jobs in, in front of the job, and then your job will be executed, okay? So it's a very simple uh, three steps process. Okay, here's just a little bit about a job priority. And so there's a key term here, which is a fair share. Fair share is actually, is, it prioritizes jobs belonging to underserved, underserviced uh, user account. It, it does that by one, it, it, look in, it is adjusted based on the recent user of the group members. So, so if, if a group member has been heavily uh, using the XPC cluster, then your job might take a little a bit longer time to, be, to run on the, on the cluster. And it is also proportional to the compute resources used by the group. So if you have been using the uh, HPC uh, extensively in the short period of time, then your job will be uh, waiting in the queue uh, longer. Yeah. And, but one thing is that the, your priority value as a job sitting in the partition, the longer it sits, the priority value actually slowly increase. increase. So your job will have a better chance to be run, uh, to be scheduled by the uh, slam schedule and launch it. It also depends on the job size. So jobs requesting more CPU are actually uh, are favored. Uh, by Slurm. So the age uh, factors, like I said, if the job has been waiting in the queue for longer, the age factor actually gradually increases and the, the, the just most likely your job will run sooner. The longer it's set, the longer you wait and the higher priority you, you, you get. Okay. And more information, if, more, if you want to have more, uh, to know more about it, we have a HPC content going to this link to be able to find some, some more information. Okay. So is there any questions up at this point? Okay, uh, if not, I'm just gonna go into how do we use software? Because uh, one of the main thing about you know, submitting a job is that the job most likely will be using the software that we have installed on MSI, okay? So how do we get to those software? All right, so software MSI, MSI has hundreds of software modules. So software environments modules are used to make software available to you. So a module is a self-contained description of a software package. So it contains the setting required to run a software package and usually encodes required dependency on other software packages. So actually a software mod a module, can, you can think of it as a, a self-contained package that it has all the dependency taken care, of, taken care of for you. And you don't have to install it. You just have to call, load up the module and run the software. It set up the environment that is appropriate or is right for the software to run. Okay, so on a high performance computing system, this is often the case that there's no software loaded by default. So whenever you log into our compute node, uh, I mean, uh, submit a job and the, the, the software that you want to use is not automatically loaded for you. So you have to run a module command to load it. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. So you can actually go into this MSI uh, uh, link down here. You will see we actually have lots and lots of software and it's a searchable directory for you to look in the software that we have 
and on there, there are also some examples on how to use a software or how to load a software. Okay. So, okay, so working with software module, how do we work with the software module? So the module, the module command is actually, like I said, interact with the environment modules. You have to use the module command. So I'm going to bring in a terminal right here. So, okay, so I'm, can everybody see this all right? Okay, so I'm I'm still logged on to the head note. So first first thing, if I want to know, um, I guess I go with this. Um, of course, I just, okay. I don't want to block this. One. Okay. okay. So you say for example, I want to use a specific. Well, actually, I want to use. Uh, say I want to know. Um, what MATLAB software version that we have at MSI, I would do a module avail. MATLAB. So it will show you all the currently installed MATLAB uh, software that we have. The newest one is uh, 2022, and the, the oldest one actually date back to 2010. Uh, so, so module avail will show you, you uh, how many uh, the available software that uh, you want to use. But that is, if you know what exact software you want to use. Sometimes you don't know, uh, say, I want to know module of that, um, say, say G, um, GC. Let's say I, I maybe just GC and see what comes up. So I actually different picks up a GCC compiler. And if I want to know um, if I have any others, like as I think everything about something is pretty tricky to find, but we might have it. Um, but okay, let's, let's say the Intel. Let's say I want to use the Intel compiler, but I don't know which one is available. So okay, so I can just type avail module avail Intel, and actually, so that it show you right away, we have the Intel two thousand nineteen, and then us also. So if you want to see exactly what. What this module has, so module show Intel. If you so just like that, it will give a default, which is 2018. So we can show it. So it actually has lots of uh, information to show you what this module is actually doing, or, or it has is set up lots of uh, environment uh, variables. So this a, a long list. Yeah. So and then you can see. Uh, let's say, let's just say I want to use. Um, module MATLAB, actually module low GCC. All right, so let's say I want to use a GCC compiler. I'm loading a default module. Actually, okay, no module. I think AV also work. So I want to load a specific uh, specific GCC module. I want to have this uh, 9.2.0. So this is how we load this GCC into my working environment. GCC 9.2.0, so I do that. And then, and then, you want to make sure it's slow that you can do a module list, which is going to correspond to the table that we have. Okay, low, okay, module list. So, so in this working around, this, this actually also load many other modules along with it. So you can see at the end here, we have GCC 9.2, but this module also load other dependency along with this GCC. Okay, so if you don't want to use this module, uh, since I only have one module loaded, I could use uh, purge command, or you could use a unload GCC 9.2.0. And then you can do a module list again. So it's nothing loaded. So, okay. And then uh, I want to show, show about this. Yeah. So, okay. Um, you guys have any question about using the module command? So it just, you have to use this, you have to use this uh, command in your JavaScript to load up, load the module. For your job, if your if your job depends on <clears throat> any of these uh, MSI install software, so for example, I can also load a my, uh, default MATLAB, and then uh, you do module list and see. So it also load up a dependency, and then I can use module unload, um, like module purge, to remove it. Okay. All right. So, 
Okay, so this is how we um, use the module system at the MSI. These are just very basic commands, but I encourage you to uh, uh, look into, uh, maybe look into man pages of the module command. So, so it help help you uh, familiar, familiar, familiar yourself with the module commands. All right, um, so, all right, so I'll give you some examples. Um, so here, example, and then this, this link can go into where lots lots of software, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now comes to, so now we know how to load a module and how to unload a module. <clears throat> so the main thing, which is the, I guess, the highlight of this tutorial, how you run a scripted or interactive jobs. All right, how do you do this too? So remember to use any of those uh, HPC cluster or nodes, we actually need to requesting the CPUs or all GPU, and you must, you must, you have to submit a job script, or you can initiate a interactive session at the command line. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So to submit a job script, that's the only one, that the command that you want to remember is the S batch command. So this S batch command would submit the job script that you prepared, you have, you have written. <clears throat> So it actually requests a, so request, uh, to request resources through a job script and you want to submit it, you just need to use the S batch command. So here's a very simple example. Uh, let's just say, okay, so I'm going to go through this uh, with you guys. Um, if you have a terminal and you log on to the MSI login node, you could also uh, go, uh, go along, uh, do this along with me. So, um, do you mind if I create a directory? So I'm creating it. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, exit. So, um, do you mind if I create a repository for it? It's time to reach it. It's a new one that you said. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. I forgot about it. I was using the last one. Uh, just interesting day. So okay, so I'm gonna go into my temp directory, and uh, here I'm gonna use a. Let's just, okay, so I go down to create another one. So I I I I'm used to using VI. So let's just say a script uh, uh, as batch. Well, you can call it any, anything you want, but I am used to doing this. So I know this is a, uh, a job that I'll be submitting to Slime Scheduler. So here, so first thing you don't want to miss is to have this line. This is this this is the first line that you must have in your script. Say I want to give it a name. So as Pangsai as badge is a, a Slime directed statement. So this is, I'm, I'm naming my job demo one. And then let's say, I just want to go I ran on the nodes. Uh, the host name. And then well, I want to sleep uh, when pointing the seconds. So this is a very simple job that I could send it to our um, Slurm scheduler. And I didn't ask for any specific partition. So it would go into a default partition that we have set up. And then let's just try to submit this job. So I want to save it. Okay, so, so I'm with the sbrash command script and submit. Okay, so once you submit that job, it, it set the account to support because I belong to the support group and also give a job ID. Okay, so it should, so I'm going to see if it, if it shows up. So, uh, so the job was uh, successful, successfully executed. And I can see the output. So I run on no, run on no ACs. A, uh, this is an agate compute node. Remember, I submitted it on a uh, from a login node, but my job actually ran on a agate compute node, ACN twenty six. And if you don't specify any output file or anything, how how to handle the output, Slurm actually automatically set up an output file with a Slurm uh, Slurm keyword upfront, and then the job ID appended at the uh, right after Slurm. So this is automatically set up for you, okay? So this is the, the first first job that I submit, uh, very simple job, and just to demonstrate the uh, sbatch command. And then 
Do you guys have any questions? Um, so, okay. So now, once you submit a job, um, you want to check the status of a job. So the command to use is SQ. Here, the SQ command, and with the option of dash dash me, which is my own. So or you could use a dash you uh, with your username to view the job status. So for example, if I submit a job, a demo one by SH, everything has been uh, as I expected, I get the account sales that support job ID. And then you use this command, it actually print out a more uh, some information for you to understand what's going on with your job. Okay, for example, this job goes into a small partition. The name of the job is uh, demo one by S SB. Um, actually, it's S batch name. And then the user, which is me, um, using this is my user login name on the uh, MSI system. And then there are some ST means what is the state the job is in, and then the time, and then the the computer note that that it will be uh, assigned to run the job. So some of the uh, important state or ST key uh, to code that you might come across uh, usually would be PD, which is a pending job. Job is waiting resources to be allocated, allocated, or cancel. If you cancel your job, then you will see the CA. And usually uh, the, the most heavy thing to see is the R, which is running, your job is running. And at the end, when the job is completed, you will see the CG, completing job is, is in the process of completing. So these are the four most commonly seen uh, state of your job once you submit it. If you use this uh, SQ command, and the reason here, the reason column that you also see, some of sometimes you will see priority. That means one of or more higher priority jobs exists uh, in the partition before your job. And also you will see resources. This, this just tells you that the job is actually waiting for resources to become available. And also sometimes you see request note not available. That means some some note that the job specifically asked for is not available at that time. Okay, so this is this is the command I often use to check to check the status of my job once I submit it. So, okay, um, maybe I can let's see if I can do this. I, I just say if I could give a demo. Let's put this to sleep for a longer time. Um, so I'm gonna try this again and show you the SQ on command. Okay. Okay, it says PD is pending, also priority. So uh, the job is waiting, has a lower priority than I expected. So it, is, it will be waiting. Um, okay, so, so you can also use a dash L flag at the end, which gives you more information. Okay, so can anybody see this? So, all right, so this job goes into I guess small partition, name is demo one, and it's just running, and the time limit one minute, note is one, using one note, which is the agate note. Let's see the demo. Okay, it's just sleeping. I believe it is sleeping. So, and also you can see Slurm also, again, I'll put a automatic generating output file for the job. Okay. All right, you guys have any question at this point about this SQ command? This is a very uh, use, useful command to, to keep track of what, what your job is doing. So, okay. all right, so, I got, um, so now I submit a very simple job. I didn't specify how to handle the outputs. So you can do that with the uh, Slurm that you capture the outputs of jobs. So using this uh, as batch output, and then also you also let you capture the error of the job using the S batch uh, error. But you have to, what you have to do is give it the file name. So, so in this very simple JavaScript that just like the one that I was using. So you could add this two statements. So let's show okay. Wait, Let me just see this. Uh, okay, so all the job has been cleared from partition. Uh, I don't have any job submitted. So let's just modify that one. Um, let's see. So now I want to specifically capture the output. Um, so I would, I would go in, say output. Um, 
Am I blocking this? I don't want to block this. Okay. So demo one percent J, which is which would give you the um, percent J is a job ID, and you want to save the output into this demo one underscore uh, and the job ID. The percent J will be replaced by the job ID, and then you want to see if there's any error. You want to capture the error if there's any. Um, so percent j so this is this is also the reason you, you leave this you have this in there is also if something goes wrong is help you to debug your job um okay so let me go i'll have to save this all right so let's just see we don't have so let's just submit the job okay Okay, well, I'll go back into the SQ command. Just pending. Okay, it's running. So this time, this job runs on a, it is running on a CN0300, which is a, uh, a Masabi, uh, from a Masabi cluster. Remember, I didn't specify the partition, so it was going to the any partition that is uh, available. Uh, any computer node is available for this job. Um, so, so, I'm sleeping. so, okay. So we could quickly see the output is in this file. So, so this is the output. And since there's no error, any error uh, generated from the job or produced by the job, this would be empty. Okay, so let's just say I make a mistake. Um, let's just say I make some mistake and I want to capture the error. Let's just say I I make a typo. So this should go into the error file. Um, so let's just try this, see what happened. Um, so, okay. All right, I'm clear. Um, so I'm sum this again. So my account and then job ID. Um, so we can see quickly see that there's some error messages. So there's have some, some error messages in there telling you what's going on. Five, two, four, six. All right, it says command not found. So, so, so if when you're uh, submitting a job, uh, you make a typo and then usually it would the typo or the any error would go into this file um so this is a good way to capture or help you to debug your uh, program sometimes the job script is really long and you have something like this it would really help you to uh, debug your program okay um so let's say so this is how we capture the output um Okay, and, and you can also use a shorthand instead of dash dash output, you can use just, just dash O or dash E for those. Okay, say, so another situation is that if you're working with different PIs, they have different accounts with MSI, and you could actually assign this job running under the account that you want it to run under, or you intend the job to run. So you could use this um, account. <coughs> Uh, account uh, um, directives say I uh, say you have a uh, I'm, I belong to support but I also belong to MSI staff I could use I could replace the support with MSI staff so the job submitted would be uh, run under the MSI staff so this is one of the good features in uh, when you are belong to multiple PI groups so you might want to use this feature to make sure that um, the, the job are run under the proper uh, the right account okay so how sometimes you may um so how do you know if you uh what account you 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 have so i usually use the uh the id id to uh, id um so this one is a list i'm under so if you belong to many many groups if you use the id command you can see all the groups that you belong to um okay um so yeah um, so some group might have bigger quota and some group might have smaller or limit on the file. So you know, so you just have to be careful on uh, what account that you are using to run the job. 
Okay, so now I'll go into, is there any questions about the S, S batch command, how to use it in an SQ command? Okay, if there is no, then I'll just keep going. So one of the, so we just talked about how to uh, submit a batch job, very simple batch script. So now I'm going to, how, how do we actually request a computer resource for running interactive jobs? Okay, so with interactive jobs, we're actually using the srun command at the login node to create a new real-time allocation of the computer resources. So think of it as a, you're requesting a shell and you interact with the computer node directly from the terminal, from the shell. So we have the same picture here again. We can actually, using this srun command to, to request one node, one task per node, or one CPU for that task. And we're asking for one gig of memory. And then we also specify the time. In this example, I, in this example the time is in a minute, so 60 minutes, and I also specify the partition. So for interactive, uh, interactive job, we have interactive partition, like we have the interactive and then the interactive GPU partitions. So let's, let's, give, let's give this a try. Um, okay, so let's give this a try. So, so here I, I put up a, an example, how you would use this command. But we can give this a try on here. So, okay. So I'm on an on a uh, login node LN006, and I want to uh, work interactively with a uh, uh, using a compute compute node. So I go um, dash dash node. So it's the same as dash n. So one one compute node. All right, one compute node, uh, one task. Uh, one call, which is dash C. And then I want the time to be dash T, so time say uh, 100 minutes, in minutes. And then I want to have maybe the memory, I don't know, eight gigs, because I'm not doing much. And then you could have, um, um, okay, so that's for the partition, I almost forgot. So I want the partition to be interactive. All right, interactive partition. So I want to do inter interactive work. Um, using this option PDY, um, asking for giving the command bash, we, we, we should file up a bash shell for you. So I submit this. Okay, so now you can see that I I have been allocated resources and uh, you can always check what is the returning uh, machine host name, which is ACN121. So after you run this command, you, you are able to work interactively uh, from this machine. Um, Okay, so this is how we how I usually get an interactive uh, dedicated interactive dedicated interactive session running to do say maybe troubleshoot my program or do whatever I want uh, do whatever research uh, work that I need to do. So this is just a quick way to doing this. So so on the slide here, I I I have a temp. This temp is actually a local scratch space. We refer to it as a local scratch space. So this 10, 50 gig coming from the compute node that you requested or being allocated to you. And this 50 gig is set aside for you for this dedicated interactive session. Sometimes, for example, you want to download a uh, large docket image or singular, singular image. And when, when you, once you unpack that image, it might lead to a large temp space. So you could use this option to get you a large temp space, uh, scratch space. So here, so here at MSI, uh, we are limited to two, uh, I guess each user is limited to two jobs uh, on the interactive partition and two jobs on the interactive GPU partition. So you can only run two interactive sessions simultaneously. Okay. Um, are there any questions? If not, I'll keep going. So, okay, sometimes this is, sometimes you might want to run a script that is required that we need, um, that we need four, four CPU per, uh, they will set up a four CPU per task. Here I have a, uh, just example demo. So here I, I'm, 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 I'm doing this interactively, but I'm actually using, running the scripts on a small partition, I use the dash P. So I'm using a machine somewhere from the small partition to run this job at, at the terminal. So you can see that. So this script actually is, is a hello world simple script. It generate, it asks for four, a CPU per time means four CPU for this task. I'm asking for one task. So Slurm will, will do a request for one task for this job. And then, so when it runs, you see the usual, the usual uh, account setup and then the allocation job ID, but the output will directly uh, show you on the, on the terminal. 
So here, the number of threads are actually four. You can see uh, zero, one, two, three. So this is a quick way to just uh, for you to test a little program um, before you uh, submit it as a batch. So, I mean, just some quick way to uh, testing how, 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 I guess, how to pro, if a uh, quick way to prototype your, your, uh, your job, see if it works or not. Because, I mean, you don't want to submit a job and wait a long time and then come back out and hope it didn't work and like that. So this is a quick way to test it out. Okay, so so for dedicated partition, like I mentioned, uh, two interactive jobs each. So okay, so yeah, um, okay. So now I'm going to show you some uh, scripted job examples. So this is the most simple uh, the, uh, job that we have. We call it the serial job. So like uh, uh, the only difference is, is that a layout. <clears throat> Remember those uh, interactive, when I request an interactive session, I lay out a long line of options. So this is just layout in a job file. So with a job name and number of nodes, I use one and requesting one task. And then the memory is four gig, four gigabytes. And this is what we've all seen before, right? So this is a very simple serial job. So this is a very simple script, job script. Okay. And a multi-threaded job. So this one asks for multi-threaded job. We can ask for more than one CPU per task. So here I'm asking for four CPU per task. And I give it name multi-threaded multi job. So this is also a pretty simple multi-threaded job. Okay, here another one is a little bit um, complicated. So let's say you want to run lots and lots of jobs, but each of the jobs are actually processing a different different input file, or input data, or, or you, have, you have a huge chunk of input data that you want, you can chop it up into different segments and each job would process just individual segments. So you could use the Slurm uh, feature, they call the job array. You could set this up. So for example, this, so everything as you show, I use one node, uh, one test per node, and give it a little time, say I say 10 minutes. So I'm actually setting up one to five. I'm um, actually, this one script is actually, actually representing five jobs. Okay, so this is a Python. Python scripts, processing uh, each input file. This uh, is an environment variable, Slurm array test ID. So each of your input file has to be numerically indexed in this case. So once I submit this job, when it start running, and you can see that each of the job is being, some are being uh, still running, some are completed, but you can see they're running on different machines, right? And this is a job ID, each one of them. So I have four, five of these jobs running simultaneously, or, uh, or could they could run simultaneously or, 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 or start at a slightly different time. But yeah, they're on different machines. But sometimes some of this array job might be all, might, might mostly stay on one machine, depends on how many calls are you're asking. So, but in my case here, we have this, this job, one job script take, takes care of five jobs, five processing need that you, you want. So this is a job array feature. And remember, uh, also job arrays will only run on the cluster you submit the job on. For example, we submit this job array job, uh, this array job on Masabi. So, so the machine that would be uh, allocated to job is going to be coming from Masabi. Okay, so, or if you submit this job array on Agate, the machine that would be yeah, allocated to job would be from Agate. It's not like what we just did. We, uh, the script that I, I Purely submit. I didn't submit a. I didn't specify a partition. So the, the machine would just come from either Agate uh, or Masabi. So, but for Java, array, you have to know, you have to know that the job will be run on the specific cluster only, and that cluster depends on where you submit the array job to, from. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here, uh, a little bit more advanced job script. Are there any questions before I move on to this? So sometimes. If you know then so sometimes you want to request a special hardware. Most of most often though the GPU. So you want to use the GPU and you have to specify using this uh, two slurm directive statements. First of all, you have to know the what partition the GPU that you want to use. So we have uh, the the V100 partition. We also uh, recently we added the A100-4 and A100-8. And also we have specified this. A uh, special option given you given to Slurm, which you need to tell the GPU is actually a V1 GPU, and in this case, I'm asking for one GPU. Okay, so this is this is all there is to it. You want to use a GPU for your job, you need to specify it specifically, um, explicitly declare that in your job script. Okay, so 
here's you can you can put down uh, say for example k40 and then GB will be k40. Okay. So so what is a preamp jobs? So a preamp job you can think of it as say you submit this job, the job running on the machine, and then some other higher priority come higher priority job comes in and your job will be automatically um, stop running or put in a suspense state. Okay, so or, or being uh, even killed. So so here it is. So why people want to use a preamp uh, partition? Because uh, because same, since a preamp partition has to give the same priority value as a non preamp job, but with a smaller impact to your fair share impacts. So in the long run, so if you're submitting lots of jobs, if you use a preamp partition to run your job, your your fair share uh, would be uh, less impact. Uh, would, would take less impact or less hits. That means you have many jobs I mean, in the future. Those jobs will not be waiting in the queue for too long. Okay, so you might want to consider using a preamp uh, partition to run your job. Okay, and if you decide, if you do decide to run your job uh, using the preamp partition, what you want to do is to add these two statements, a slurm directed statement, which is the uh, partition you call preempt, and with some other partition, uh, preamp partition as well, and then also add the requeue, requeue uh, slurm directive. So what this, and you also, one thing is make sure that your job is actually being, is able to recover after it stopped, recover or resume from where it left off. Okay, so if you know your job would be able to resume from where it left off, then it is a good, uh, it's a it's a good candidate job candidate to use a preamp job partition. So what I have here is a uh, parallel command to to do some processing. Uh, the GNU parallel actually, so I use I use a module load parallel we have installed at MSI, and parallel actually have a very very nice feature. It will resume resume the computation from where it is left off if it is interrupted. So this is, uh, if you have any parallel job that uses uh, GNU parallel, then this is a good candidate to run on a preempt partition. Okay, so um, so the important thing to keep in mind is that job submitted to preempt queue can be killed at any time to make room for interactive jobs. So once, so if the system gets really busy, lots of people using interactive jobs, and if the system sees us, there's a job on the preempt queue that can be killed, it will be killed to make room for the indirect jobs that are coming in. So, so the good good thing is to make sure that your job is able to resume from where it left off, and you just need to do a little bit of uh, scripting. Okay. So also this uh, this is the uh, dependency jobs. So sometimes you want to have job that depends on the other jobs. So this is a little uh, fancy feature from uh, from Slurm. So for example, I have a job depends on. So you you have a you have a workflow. You have a chain of jobs that you want to run. Maybe the first job, you submit the first job, and then the first job successfully run, and the second job will start, and then so on and so forth. So for the top, for in this box, <clears throat> in this box, I have a job that's, that's uh, called data, data prep .s batch. So I submit this one. This is all in a uh, batch script, okay? So when I when I use this one, once the 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 keyword here is the dependency. So you want the dependencies after okay. That means after OK with the uh, uh, job one, which is a job ID, the job ID was saved into this variable. So when this is run and it is OK without error, and then the second job will kick in, this analyze data one dot, dot S batch. And then if that one is OK, and if this one run without error, and the third one will start, which could depends on the job job two ID, and then start with the next one, analyze data two and so on and so forth. So and at the end you go, so at the end we have the, the last one, which is a summary. So this all depends on the previous job that being, uh, that is run and without error, without any uh, error uh, during the run. Okay. And then, uh, and then, and also we could try to set, and another scheme is that uh, final job. So here we have, have the same as data prep. And then also this two job depends on the first job. So if the first job ran successfully, this two, two job will simultaneously uh, start. And so this is as batch command. So job two and job three, and then do a summary. So yeah, and then this one, that's what dependency of the job two is. Right, right. So yeah, this is just, uh, this is very, um, this is the very simple way to set up a fan of job. Um, are there any questions about this um, or the preamp or dependency? Um, if not, um, 
let's just say, okay, let's just say, so we go from here to here. So the location for jobs. Um, so when you submit a job, so you can see that I'm actually submitting from my home directory, right? home directory, right? So which is most of the time you would stage and run your job from there because home directory is backed up and snapshot. So if you lose any data, you also always go back into snapshot and recover it. So we mostly work off of my uh, of your home directory, but there are also some temp spaces like scratch spaces that are available to stage your job and run your job from there. So one of them is the uh, scratch.local. This is a temp storage space from a compute node. Remember when your job requests a compute node, the compute node actually has a has a disk and uh, that is available to the job. We call that the temp uh, temp temp disk. Uh, remember when we do the uh, s uh, as run command using the, the temp option, asking for temporary space. So this is with sensor wireless. So your job can actually run or, or uh, stage any input files or output files on the temp, uh, temp space or scratch.local. And before the job, right before the job finish, make sure you have to copy all the files that you need back to your home directory. Because this temp space is not permanent, it's, it belongs to a compute node. Once your job uh, finished running, the slim would just return all the resources back to the pool and your job would, you have to make sure that your job script actually could actually copy off all the necessary files that you need back to your home. Okay. So another space that you could, another temp uh, scratch space that you could stage your job is the uh, scratch.global. So for example, uh, you, your job actually generates lots and lots of intermediate files and you don't want to keep all of them just a few, or your group quota is not large enough to handle all the large data files. And uh, then you could consider using the scratch.global to, to stage your job. And once the job finishes, make sure it's just copy back to your home directory. One of the good thing about the scratch.global is that you could actually keep the data there for 30 days. And after that, it will be automatically deleted. And this scratch.global is not backed up. It's, it's not snapshotted. So whatever you stay, you, you, whatever you, Whenever you put your files under the uh, scratch.global, just make sure that you copy them off to your home directory before the 30 days limits. Otherwise, they'll be permanently deleted. So, but scratch global is a very big, large disk space. Um, it's, it's good to run it if you have lots and lots of files to process and then you don't want to keep all of them, just want to keep the results. So this will be a good space to use. Okay, and more information on the uh, scratch storage space could be found on this link. Okay, um, are there any questions about this? Because uh, th this is quite important. So most of the time we run our jobs off our home directory. And in some special cases, you could use scratch.local and also some special cases you could use scratch.global. Okay, all right. Okay, so now uh, how do we mind our script jobs? So I already mentioned with the SQ command. So I, I'll show you the SQ command, um, which is pretty useful. Uh, here I put up a uh, in the, uh, an example here. So, so one of the things is that if uh, to be nice to Slurm, um, if you could use ask you could use a watch command with SQ uh, with a very short time interval, but that would not be uh, too nice to Slurm. So, so so I usually use SQ uh, uh, just a few times to see how the job is going. Okay. Um, so for current job, oh, you could also for to monitor your current job, you could also uh, put in, uh, you could also use the take advantage of the Slurm email notification statements. So here are three directives that you could use to make sure that you, uh, to keep track of your job. So here I put in Slurm mail type equals begin. So whenever my job begins, Slurm will actually send me an email and notify me my job has begun running. And here is the aspect mail type end. That means when the job has finished or, or is completed, Slurm will also alert me using email, telling me that the job has ended. And all you have to do is give Slurm your email address that you want Slurm to use to send you an email. And so this is a very simple job script. So these three uh, lines here would actually take advantage of the Slurm email notification system. So for example, if you get, it, so this is what it looks like when you get it email from Slurm. So, so the sender, the Slurm sending email is actually the, the MSI Slurm. You will see something like this similar and with the uh, Slurm email address as a sender, okay? And the subject subject line usually looks like this. Here I have a demo. So I use, you see Slurm and then job ID, your job ID, 
and give it, and they also give it the name of the job that has begun, and then it will, it will tell you how long the job was stay, uh, was in the queue before you execute it. So and then the body is empty, the email. So this is what you will see in the email when it began. Okay, um, let's say. Okay, so so using email, and then also you could use another way to monitor your job is that you could use the s run command if you know the job ID. So here is the s run command with a job ID and asking for a bash shell. So this will work, but it would not work if you're running MPI tests. So you want to monitor your MPI MPI jobs. So you should not be you, you, should, you would not want to use the s run command, but you could use the ssh command. Remember, um, you could actually log into the node that your job is running on. So you could use from a terminal, you would use SSH and then the node ID. So log into the compute node. So remember the SQ command actually give you the node that the job is running on. So we can use this command, log into the node that to monitor your, your job. So node ID is returned by the SQ command. Okay, so this is very useful to just look at how your job is doing. You, you simply just log on to the node and take a look at that. But once you log into the to our, our, um, our login nodes, and then you know them, and you can use the SQ command to look up the node ID and then the SS section into it to see what the job is doing. Okay, are there any questions? All right, so, uh, so another command that I wanna tell you uh, is the, uh, so say your job has completed and you can use the SEFF command with the job ID. This will give you a very uh, user-friendly summary of your job. For some, it tells you the CPU utilization, actually the memory utilization is more important. So you want to know, for example, you have a little job that you want, you have a little uh, prototype job that you want to see how much memory it is taking up. You could use this command once it is completed. You can see how much memory that little job is taking, is using. So this is one of the command to monitor your uh, completed jobs. Okay, another command, this is, this is a, a this is like the S, this this command S A C C T dash J job ID. This command is a very uh, is a I would say it's a very powerful command because you could use this one to see all sorts of information about your job. So what I have here is a is an example. So I submitted this job previously. Uh, the job name is uh, run MD, and I'm using this command with a formatting uh, input. Uh, I, I I would like to see the job ID, the job name max rss max rss is actually the resident set size the largest resident set size of the job which is the largest memory the job we use and then I'll, i also i want to ask for the task max rss task and then max rss node just the, the node that carry out the most extensive work for me and then i also want to know how long the job would take so this is one of the command you can look at once the job has finished this is uh one of the command so let's say I want I submit a job and I I want to cancel it. So you could use the s cancel command with a job ID. So to cancel all your jobs and all your pending job, you can just use s cancel dash u, which is your username. So that will cancel all your jobs that on the uh, you, that you have submitted. And then if you want to cancel a particular job that is pending, you could use the s cancel dash t pending and then your username. So this will cancel the job that is in pending state. The your job that is put on the pending pending state, you will cancel it. So whenever you want to cancel a job, as cancel is a command to use. Okay, so now just some uh, troubleshooting tips. Okay, so a typical workflow of a job is, is this. So first thing to do is you create a job script. So there are a few key resource requests in your job script, right? The note, the core, how many nodes and calls does your job need? And the time, how long does your job need to run? And the memory, how much total memory does your job need? And also the partition, which partition fits your job best? Okay, and then you submit that doing S, using the sbatch command. And then you check the job status with the, with the sq command. And then when the job finishes, check the output of the log files, if there's any. And if the job fails, you, you can look into your job script and then resubmit it and go back to step one. But if a job succeeded, you can also look into using these two commands to see what what actually happened to your job or what is what did your job do and if the if the output actually matches what you expected. So this is just a typical uh, cycle of submitting a job, uh, getting a job run, and then check the output. 
So this is the very simple uh, workflow. Okay, here, so this is the page that you will find on our website. It lists, for example, it lists all the partition names, but all the columns, all the columns actually here is a, for example, if this node is sharing, that means no sharing means that uh, you submit a job to a partition. Um, a, a node is being uh, allocated to your job from say AMD small. But if you, don't, if you do not want to share that computer node with any other jobs, you would want this to be, you will use this flag to say no. You, uh, you want this flag in there in your job to say exclusive. That means the node would only exclusively belong to your, to your job, no one else. Okay, so okay, so uh, this is a simple um, a slam directed matching uh, to the, each column. So dash p uh, is the partition name. So exclusive meaning either you want to share the node with someone else or not. And n test is a corporate nodes. How many tasks you want for your job? And the wall time limit is the time directive hours, minutes, and second. And then total memory is this this very shorthand a uh, mem option. And then you could also specify the memory per CPU. And, and also I mentioned this local scratch node, local scratch space per node, you can using this temp option. Like if, if you know that you want to have some processing logs file and you want to save them in the temp directory, uh, temp space, you could use this option, set up your job using a temp space. And also this is maximum nodes per job. Uh, I can see that there is, so for some of the partition you can, allow you to use 32 computer nodes, for some of them only one. So here you specify just one node, okay, dash dash node. So if you submit a job, say, uh, to AMD Lodge, but you are not uh, using 32 nodes, um, we have some other partition that uh, you could, um, I guess the best way to say it is that uh, unless, your node, unless your job needs that many nodes, otherwise some other partition would better fit for, for your job. Okay, so um, so your job script should have all this uh, as batch directives. Once it once the script has no more as batch directives in the script, it would just see as a uh, uh, as, as the first non comment non white space line has been reached in the script, which will stop processing all the uh, shell command in the, in the script or all the, all the command you have written in the script. Okay, so um, writing job script. Um, Okay, sometimes, sometimes um, if you develop or you, if you write your jobs script using a word processor and then you upload it to our system. So our system is, is Unix. Say if you use word processor, uh, but but I highly recommend not to use word processor to write your script because there's some hidden character once you upload it to the MSI system that is hidden in the job script and then slow might not understand it. So if you, just in case you, if you did use a word processor, you could use uh, one of those two popular utility, DOS to Unix or Unix to DOS to convert them. But I would really highly recommend using a plain text editor or from a terminal, uh, either VI, Nino, or Pickle. This will work. Okay. So I mentioned the module using module. So, so I like to start off my job uh, with a clean environment. So I, I like to put out, put the uh, module purge command. Uh, right after all my slurm directive statements. So that means I start off clean. Um, so um, uh, you could also use uh, export equal none uh, directive in your JavaScript to suppress the inherits of your environment setting. So that means that if you submit your job from a shell they've been working on, the environment is very really complicated. And once you submit the job from there, slurm might pick up some ROM variable values when, and they might, that might be inherited into the job. So to, to prevent that, you could use this export export equal none or a module uh, purge to clean the to uh, sanitize your script, uh, so to speak. Okay. So another thing, some other troubleshooting tips here is that uh, I I also see this myself. So when I submit a job, I see the incorrect resource configuration. That means something wrong with my JavaScript. Well, uh, the the place that might be. Uh, might have the mistake is that I don't know how to request the uh, resources properly to the partition or to a partition that I want to use. So you will see some something like this. So when you see something like this, uh, so here memory spec specification cannot be satisfied. So I would go in, go on to the Slurm partition uh, specification website and take a look what are the limit on there. So so that you know maybe you maybe you asking for too much memory or too large of a temp space. So yeah, so something like that. So also here another one. So this is a good one to uh, 
Let me rest for demo. So, so here I have this uh, test only. So this is essentially doing dry run of your scripts. So for example, I want to uh, submit a submit this job, right? But I I'm kind of hesitated to see in my Slurm directive I actually working. So I can do a test only. So this is only a test only, right? So if I do that, so I don't see any error messages, and it also tells me that my job will start at this time, 13, uh, 15 30, uh, which is almost coming up, using one processor on a Nodes AC and 121 in partition AMD small. So if I say, if I do some, so this is a try one, so the job is not being submitted. But I want to see if I get my slurm directory statement correct. Say if I have something, um, let's say, let's see if, I, if I make a mistake here somewhere. Um, what's a good one to do? Okay, so if I say if I request a GPU, right? Uh, let's just say K point GPU, and I uh, mistakenly put it into a partition that would not have a K forty for me. Let's just say small. Okay, so if I use that command, if I use this uh, command again to see if it works. So it should tell me uh, this is not gonna work because a resource requested configuration is not available, right? So this is a good way to check. If you have a bunch of uh, SBAS statements, sometimes you lose track of what it is. So you could use this before you submit it. So this is a good way to uh, validate your Slurm script and return an estimate of job, uh, the time of estimate uh, uh, running a start time of your job. So, but remember no job is actually submitted. You use a test only option. So going back to uh, troubleshooting tips using the uh, SACC command, most of the time, um, if you do not request enough memory, your job will be killed uh, because we try to use more than what it is allocated. So here I'll, put, I'll give you an example. So I named the job, dash J is the name for the job, dash dash J. I named OOM, which is uh, all the memory. And this is uh, very simple. So for mem per CPU, I asked for 10 megabytes. And the time is five minutes. So I'm running a little command, a stress test, I'm actually asking for is using 120 megabytes. So the job will not be able to run to completion or successfully run because when I use this command to check it, when it, so I get I get an email saying that my job actually failed and I'm curious what happened. So if I use this command with this following uh following up uh, uh options, I see that it is out of memory. Um okay. So I can see I can go back in there and say, oh, I see I need to ask for more memory. So this is one of the common. Uh, common scenario that we run into when your job is our memory getting killed, getting killed. <clears throat> okay. So you know when it's a timeout issues. So for example, you didn't, you didn't ask for enough time for your job. So here, here I just changed a little bit from the last one. So, so everything is the same. But, but remember, I'm asking for uh, one minute here, but this job using 200 seconds, right, which is more than a minute. So here you will see using this using this uh, syntax a command again, SAC to with this uh, with this option you see that it's timeout is well, I didn't ask for enough time okay so this is also a way to see when you get an email saying your job failed you can use this command to take a look what actually happened so these are all the common issues and then also you want to maybe you're curious about what the, the what are the specific or what is the specific exit code for your job so for for example I'm seeing this 127 fail 127 usually uh, is a memory issue um so so this is very helpful. And uh, let's see, find the exit code. And here's a table. Here's a table that I want to show you or share with you the exit code that you commonly, commonly see from a from the job. So the zero, zero means everything runs has, has been completed successfully. And one, if you get a one, it's a general error. You, you can probably check your log files if there's any, or check your output. And two, incorrect use of shell or built-in commands. For example, maybe the echo was typed wrong, like, like that. You also want to check the log files. And here's some other, the, the, the exit code has to go from three to 124. This is a job error. It's not specific to software that you're using. A 125, one, 125 out of memory, and 126 the command not executed. So if you get uh, exit, code, exit code is larger than 129, you have to subtract it from 128 to get it and to match the signal uh, and match the signal. Um, so let's see. I have to put the signal, I think it's a command. So if I want to say, you can do a man page uh, kill. 
I need a bunch of signal. Um, um, oh, is this signal? What was coming? What was this? I don't know. The signal from that. Is it cubes? Uh, looking up all the signals. Um, this is uh, I forgot. What's it? So here are all the signals that you can look into, but this most of the time, um, CQ9, uh, you also see. So these are the signals that you could take a look at. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So here I put up some links that for you to uh, go further, um, look into more information. So with it, these are the links, uh, FAQ. Um, also, if you have any questions or anything that is not, not too clear to you, you could also submit a help ticket to uh, help desk. And here are the uh, Sloan cheat sheets, which is a summary of uh, Sloan. Uh, it, this one is actually coming from the Sloan uh, website. Okay. Um, okay, do you guys have any questions? Um, so there's 